Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our virtual community. Thank you so much for tuning and streaming in with us today. My name is Vinita, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the teaching pastor here at Forefront. And I am grateful for your presence here today. Um, it's been quite a day, uh, very emotional. We've had um, the desire and the ability to be able to celebrate National Coming Out Day during our first service as well as this service. And we are also continuing to pray for our dear friend and sister, our worship pastor here, uh, Angela, who continues to mourn the loss of her dear husband, Pierre. Um, this morning when I showed up at 8 o'clock to set up church, well, sorry, I was five minutes late today. I was holding it in. But anyway, Pierre um, would always be here. He is so uh, faithful. He had been just such a dedicated member of this church. And even though I've only been here for a short period of time, Pierre and Angela have tremendously impacted my life. So um, today we honor his life. So as I mentioned, today is National Coming Out Day. And our topic for today is loving and dignifying our neighbors. And this sermon is dedicated to the people who have shared with me that they identify within the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, plus, plus, plus communities, but no longer connect with their communities of faith because they were told that they could not own their sexual orientation, they couldn't own their gender identity, and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This sermon is also dedicated to all of the people who identify within the community but are still working in churches where they can be active but not out. Those who are included in churches where they can only be present but not fully included. Finally, this sermon is dedicated as we lift up Pierre today. We also lift up the life and legacy of uh, my former pastor, the late Reverend Nancy Butler, who in numerous ways taught me how to be a pastoral ally. Her daughter actually attends this church, Sarah Butler. And Pastor Nancy also taught me to strive for beauty in the neighborhood through the unconditional love of God. How many of you remember Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Anyone? <laughs> I, used to, <laughs> I used to love Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And Mr. Rogers was actually striving for a beautiful day in the neighborhood with this popular children's show. It actually ran from 1968 to 2001. He had a 895 episodes. I used to love to watch it. Among other things, Mr. Rogers was a performer, a composer, a father, a grandfather, and he was also an ordained Presbyterian minister. And he was deeply committed to helping young children love and appreciate themselves uh, and to love others and to essentially be a good neighbor. As you may remember, Mr. Rogers covered a broad range of topics over the years, and the series tackled issues that other children's programming avoided. <sighs> Avoidance, yeah. I wanted to avoid the topic of LGBTQIA plus inclusion for a very long time. I wanted to avoid it even though I knew that it was not a beautiful day in the neighborhood for queer, trans, and non-conforming people. I was taught a theology of exclusion, and when I was actually exposed to a more progressive theology and more progressive teachings, I initially avoided those teachings. However, for over a decade, and because of connections to friends and hearing their stories, I have been able to, air quotes here, come out, if you will, as an ally, 
as a pastor, as a friend, as a neighbor to all people who identify within this community. And as they continue to experience oppression and marginalization from within the church and without, I believe that their heartfelt cry to you and to you and to me sounds a little like Mr. Rogers. Won't you please, won't you please, please won't you be my neighbor? Therefore, I believe it is important to be intentional about welcoming the queer community into our family of faith. Let's look at our story today, which can be found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. And it reads, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for an extra, any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So as the story unfolds, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Come on, what else is new? All right. Didn't necess necessarily seem like he had a ton of hostility, but he asked a question. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This gets me every time. The Jewish understanding of eternal life that he is referring to is a question about how do I live with God now? How can I experience God now? How can I live a life that is connected to God in a meaningful way? How can I live so that I can experience the abundant joy, grace, and goodness and all of the beautiful things that flow out of being connected to God. So Jesus answered with a question. What is written in the law of Moses? He replied, how do you read it? Well, the lawyer answered, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Jesus draws this connection between inheriting or receiving eternal life with this commandment. 
He said, if you really want to live, not just take up space, but live, not simply exist, but live in the here and now, then love God with all that you are. Your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. If you do this, you will experience abundant life, that goodness, peace, and joy. And this, my friends, is life in all its fullness. And it's not earned, but received in the context of love. And then the lawyer posed another question. Well, wait a minute. Who's my neighbor? And I feel like Jesus is saying, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and he begins with this parable, which Jesus did quite often, a parable. It's a story that illustrates a particular point or some sort of lesson. And this particular parable is referred to as the parable of the Good Samaritan. As the story goes, there's a certain man who's on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, which happens to be a very dangerous stretch of ro roadway. And then some robbers came and attacked this man and they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him up pretty badly and left him for dead. So as we see in the story, a priest, a religious leader, comes along, sees him in this bloody, half-naked, half-dead, situation and he's like I'm out <laughs> and he passes by on the other side next a Levite who served particular religious duties comes by and sees this man in this broken down state and crosses to the other side as well and next is a Samaritan who historians have said that in ancient times have had strange relationships with the Jews. And it's interesting that the Samaritan sees the man and actually stops and cleans his wounds and takes him to an inn and says, whatever charges there are, I will pay the bill. Jesus asked the expert in the law, who was the neighbor? the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, I'm going to need you to go and do likewise. This parable caused me to ask, who do we choose to see? And who do we choose not to see and ignore? Who are the invisible ones? I went many years choosing not to see the LGBTQIA plus community. And it's so important for us to realize that when we refuse to see someone, it is extremely dangerous because we rid them of their humanity. I recognize that in various churches, thank God not forefront, this is still a disputable matter just like whether or not women should um, preach in the church and have leadership responsibilities in the church, just like issues surrounding divorce, this is a disputable matter. And Ken Wilson talks about these disputable matters in his book entitled, Letter to My Congregation, An Evangelical Pastor's Path to Embracing People Who Are Gay, Lesbian, and Transgender in the Company of Jesus. <sighs> Let's be honest. There are respected theologians who could de deconstruct strict scripture and eloquently argue for their inclusivity. And then there are those who interpret the same verses in different ways and argue against affirming this community in the church. I personally have found freedom and joy in genuinely loving the LGBTQIA plus community or the non-cis het community. 
is so important that I continually love unconditionally. Now, I thought I was loving at one point. However, I realized that I was only skimming the surface. The more I connected with God on this issue, the more my relationship with Jesus Christ began to be strengthened. And as I mentioned earlier, it has really helped me live life to the full. It hasn't been easy at times. I've actually had to take one or a couple for the team. I've lost friends. People have distanced themselves from me, but please don't feel sorry for me. As someone who identifies within the heterosexual community, I have certain advantages. Guess what? Todd and I get to walk down the street without and hold hands without even thinking about it, without having to negotiate our space or where we are. I can also talk freely about what I did over the weekend and talk about my partner and feel very comfortable with that. I can also go to movies <laughs> and see my relationship pretty much reflected in every movie that I see. However, it's important for me to use my advantages to be able to create spaces for the queer community. And as it relates to my various intersections and my social identities, I'm still a black woman and I experience marginalization on a regular basis. But even though I carry these points of oppression, I can still create spaces for others to be affirmed. I actually have a good friend that was very curious about my advocacy and allyship. She said, Benita, I mean, I, I thought you were for the black people. And I said, dear friend, aren't black people in the LGBTQIA community? Can I get an amen? amen. <sighs> so the reality is that my liberation is connected to the liberation of all oppressed groups. This week, Archbishop Desmond Tutu celebrated his 90th birthday. And he said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. As I share my personal journey supporting and affirming the LGBTQIA community, I mean, let's be real, I still get things wrong. But I continue to check in with people in a respectful way and clarify and do the work alongside the queer community. I believe that if we are to love God with our entire being, then the love for our neighbor can continue to grow and grow. And if we see the queer community beaten up by federal and local laws and asked offensive questions, forced to endure off comments, stripped of their humanity and dignity and left broken, then we do this community a disservice when we pass by on the other side. The emotional and psychological scars that some members of this group have endured and continue to endure are great. They have, particularly our youth, high rates of suicide, anxiety, and depression. Sadly, this year has already seen 38, according to the Human Rights Campaign, 38 transgender or gender nonconforming people fatally shot or killed by other violent means. They say at least 38 because too often these stories go unreported. So in preparing for this service, Men, I wanted to be able to get us as a church community to think about some of the things this community wants our church to know. And I posed this question, what do you want people to know about the LGBTQIA plus community? And I received a number of responses and I'd like to read you one by someone who was very near and dear to me. He identifies as a gay black man. And he goes on to say that it is the church's role in fighting oppression. 
From abolitionism to civil rights, the church has played a critical role in restoring humanity to those who have been ostracized. Even Jesus Christ can be revered as a human rights activist. So, like Christ, he goes on to say, it is our duty as Christians to actively fight oppression and any threat to human rights. I say all that to say this, he says, that while some Christians don't believe in overtly denouncing homosexuality, treating gay people and or their relationships as less valuable in the eyes of God is a form of oppression. And while they may believe that homosexuality is a sin, being a shepherd for oppression is a grave sin in and of itself. He goes on to say, God may be tough on her children, but she would never oppress us, end quote. So as allies, we must really see this community for who they are and ask what they need and educate ourselves so that we can truly love and dignify everyone. A final word about today's Bible story. While we can make all sorts of assumptions about why the priest and the Levi did not stop for the man who was beaten and left half dead, we don't really know why they didn't stop. What we can do, though, is take the opportunity to look within our own hearts and reflect upon who is our neighbor and who we are being a neighbor to. Maybe you're on a particular journey and it feels unsafe because coming out as an ally may be too risky for your reputation. Maybe you don't want to get your hands dirty. Perhaps you feel like this will make you too vulnerable. Maybe you feel some form of death, death of your good name, death of friendships, death of your comfort zone. I can certainly relate. As for Mr. Rogers, his biographer, Michael G. Long, noted that even though Mr. Rogers was known to include homosexual individuals among his friends and cast them on his show, at one point, he actually condemned gay marriage. We all deal with discrepancies and struggles and our own evolutions. However, God still loves us and God calls us their own. Long said, at last, perhaps we should turn the camera lens toward ourselves and assure Fred Rogers that we like him just as he was. The opposite of machismo, a loving husband and father, a close friend, employer of gays, a man who grew to support at least one friend's desire for an openly gay relationship, and above all else, a compassionate human being who assured each of us that no matter who we are and what we do, we are always and everywhere lovable and capable of loving anyone just as they are. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this, do this, and you and all of us will live. And the people of God said, amen. 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 I'm going to invite our band up at this time as we prepare for our National Coming Out Day ceremony. You know, in speaking to so many members of the LGBTQIA community, they have said that having the opportunity to come out can be very empowering and rewarding. 
Others have said some may not have a desire or ability to come out. For some, coming out may pose a threat to their emotional or physical safety. Some have been harmed by the church, by being dragged out of the closet against their will. Some have been rejected by family and church communities altogether. Today, we are creating a welcoming and safe and brave and loving and joyful environment for individuals who identify within the community and have a desire to come out. Whether you're coming out for the first time or the 50th time, you'll have an opportunity just to stand to the right of this door and share your name and you'll be able to share your pronouns and any identities that you feel comfortable sharing with our church community today. And then you'll get to walk through the door and receive the love from your community of faith. Those of you who are worshiping with us virtually, at the given time, we encourage you to drop your coming out story, your identities in the chat. And then once you come out, you'll be able to receive communion from Mac. And as we prepare our hearts right now for communion, before I invite our volunteers up for those who are coming through our door today, I want us to just think about how wonderful it is for Forefront to be a church that Sunday after Sunday gets to celebrate communion. And we welcome everyone to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we get to remind everyone that no matter how you identify, you are able to come to the table without fear, without guilt, without shame. And we have made room for you today at the table. So our communion chalice has a little wafer representative of the body of Christ. The wafer is not gluten-free this time. We'll be getting them soon. And then there is alcohol-free juice. And remember that the body of Christ was broken for you and the blood was shed for you. Amen? Amen. So at this time, for those that want to participate in our national coming out day, first ever, hopefully it'll be a tradition here at Forefront, we invite you to just walk over to where Diana is and stand right next to Diana and you can line up and then you're gonna walk on the stage, you're gonna grab a mic, Diana already has the mic, and walk right here. Everyone can come through. We have some, give it up, give it up for people who are volunteering. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. This is awesome, this is awesome today. This is a big deal. They get to do this in a loving environment. So we're going to ask our first volunteer, Diana, thank you so much to come on up and share your name and your pronouns and any identities you want to share with our community today. Hi, I'm Diana, uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a lesbian and I identify as queer. Woo! Woo! Yay! Woo! Be careful. Hi, I'm Daniel Jose. I'm a queer man of trans experience. I'm a Latino, I'm an immigrant, I'm a person of color, and I'm proud of all of those things. <laughs> Woo! Beautiful. Amen. Hi, my name is Natasha. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a lesbian and I identify as queer, and this is my wife. <laughs> I am Mary. My, uh, all pronouns are okay with me, and I identify as queer. 
And and what else? That's what they said. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Woo woo. Woo. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Hi, I'm Chris. He, him, his, and I'm gay. And I'm Tom. He, him, his, and I'm also gay. <laughs> awesome. Come right through the door. Woo! Give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up! Woo! Hello, uh, my name is Christina Calcote. My pronouns are she, they. I am bisexual and genderqueer, uh, and I'm Asian American, and I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Woo! Yay! Beautiful! I'm Jonathan, I am gay, and I am a pastor's son. Um, so. Woo! All right, Jonathan! 